I'm not sure about you, but when I was watching that cartoon, before I was about to get voted off the stage, uh, when we were watching that cartoon of John the Baptist, who here watches Gardening Australia? Who thought John the Baptist looked a bit like Costa? <laughs> yeah, there's a few of us, all right. Um, it's good to share with you today and to continue in our series looking at the, the Gospel of Luke and as we spend time looking at various snapshots from the life of Jesus. And also welcome to our podcast listeners. Um, we've had almost 2,500 listens uh, from Brisbane in Queensland to um, Boardman in Oregon, from Catalonia near Barcelona in Spain to Canberra. Um, it's amazing where people pick up on these podcasts and I'm not sure how they do, but they do, so that's wonderful. So welcome to you if you're listening as well. What are you like at getting ready? Now, this isn't a dig at anyone that might have been running late today, so please, you're off the hook, okay? If you want to feel guilty about it, then I'll take confessional afterwards. Um, but what do you like at feeling guilty? What do you like at being prepared? Some people are always on time, aren't they? You know, you can rely on them. They're always on time. And some are never on time. They are always perpetually late. It's, it's as if they are never prepared. Now, make sure you are not elbowing anyone sitting either side of you. Um, according to a report in 2006 by Proudfoot Consulting, um, lateness of CEOs cost the US economy around $90 billion dollars in lost productivity. People who wait for others often feel that the lateness is a display of a mark of disrespect, out of a lack of um, consideration. Now, studies have found that not being ready can come as a result of trying to do too many things all at once, wanting to multitask, and oh, I can just fit this in, and I can just do this and this at the same time, and, and that sort of thing, and as a result of it, it can have them running late, or they're not able to picture in their mind how long a task will actually take. Have you ever done that? What will you need to complete a task? You know, we have some tradesmen coming into the office on Tuesday morning at 7.30 and I'm going to be meeting them here. And so I'm wanting to make sure that as we um, have Monday in the office that we need to, because we're reconfiguring um, an entrance and, and changing around some office doors and that sort of thing. And I'm wanting to make sure that everything is ready for their arrival. I'm wanting to prepare a way for them because at 7.30... I want to be able to walk in and know that it's all there, ready to go, rather than having to do a mad race around, especially when you're paying tradesmen at their rate of pay. If you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. It was around 28, maybe 29 AD, when John was called out of the wilderness to get people ready, to help them prepare for the arrival of the Messiah. So let's allow Luke to set at first the political and the religious landscape of the day as we look at Luke chapter 3 verses 1 and 2. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. The words are on the screen as well but if you've got your Bible that's great. If you need a Bible have a chat to us. We would love to get a Bible to you as well. Luke chapter 3 verses 1 and 2. It was now the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius the Roman Emperor. Pontius Pilate was the governor over Judea. Herod Antipas was the ruler over Galilee. And his brother Philip ruled over Oturia and um, Triconitus. Licinius was ruler over Abilene. Annas and Caiaphas were high priests. Now, there's probably a couple of reasons why um, Luke rattles off these names uh, of several prominent figures. First, Luke is wanting to establish a bit of an understanding of the timeline, the timing of when John was called into action to help people to get ready. As a result of an ever-narrowing um, timeline or uh, year range, we can narrow it down to be around AD 28 give or take a year either side, because we're never quite sure which calendar people are operating off, because there are a range of different calendars that people used at the time. 
But the second and probably um, more important thing that Luke wants to highlight is the political, religious and social landscape of the day. By the time Tiberius is in his 15th year that Luke refers to, he has already moved into semi-retirement. So Terry, what's semi-retirement like? It's not too bad. Busy? Yeah, it can be quite busy. Well, Tiberius um, had moved into uh, semi-retirement and he'd um, moved out of Rome, as it were, and governing in that sort of space. And he had left his administ- the administration of Rome and the Roman Empire into the hands of his unscrupulous and despicable favourite, Sergius, who was plotting at the time to see Tiberius' son, Drusus, poisoned. He worked with, um, you know, uh, I think it was Drusus' wife, and she was slipping slowly over a period of time poison to Drusus, um, and that was to protect, uh, protect Serginius and his hold on power. Locally, people of Israel were largely oppressed by the local Roman government, and the Jewish sellouts compromising themselves to get ahead in the eyes of Rome. There was meant to only be one high priest. But note that in this passage we have two, Annas and Caiaphas. Annas was removed from his role as high priest by the Roman government and was replaced by Caiaphas. And so as a result of that, there would be something similar to, as you can imagine, Somewhere like China, occupying Italy and removing one Roman Catholic Pope and installing someone else whom they hoped would be more compliant with their will. So much for separation of church and state. Yet despite this, Annas um, still had much influence And so Luke records him um, as being a high priest as well, as a joint single high priest, Annas and Caiaphas. So into a landscape of Roman dictatorship where there was a scramble to climb the political ladder and to remove or to kill anyone who stands in your way. Into a landscape where Israelites were either um, suppressed or slipped through the cracks, as it were, of Roman oppression by compromising themselves and sucking up to Rome. Into this landscape, John walks in after spending time in the wilderness. And we continue in Luke 3, verse 2. At this time, a message from God came to John, son of Zechariah, who was living in the wilderness. Then John went from place to place on both sides of the Jordan River, preaching that people should be baptized to show that they had turned to God to receive forgiveness for their sins. Isaiah had spoken of John when he said, He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the roads for him. The valleys will be filled and the mountains and hills made level. The curves will be straightened and the rough places made smooth. And then all the people will see the salvation sent from God. Luke gives us a summary of John's message. People should be baptized to show that they have turned to God to receive forgiveness for their sins. Now, it's interesting because people in Israel primarily saw themselves as being the righteous ones. They were in the right relationship with God. The Messiah was coming to save them, not from their sins, but from the Romans. After all, as I said, they were the righteous ones. God's called out people. But then along comes John and with both hands firmly gripping the cage, he shakes and rattles it. We are the ones who need saving. Not the world out there, but we from our sins. We need saving from our selfish behavior that puts me in front of God. No, 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 it's, it's not a case of boo and hiss to the world out there. Look at yourselves. Look at how far off track you have come from God's path. Your selfish, me first attitude. 
Your willingness to fudge and compromise puts you and me in the box seat for the need of God's forgiveness of our sins. Centuries before the Cane Ridge revival, people responded to John's call to repent. But then, just as the movement began to gather momentum, some wanted to join in because the image that it gave them, or to come and see the show that John called, um, was putting on. And John calls them out in verse 7. When the crowds came to John for baptism, he said, You brood of snakes, who warned you to flee from uh, God's coming wrath? Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Don't just say to each other, we're safe, for we're descendants of Abraham. That means nothing. For I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. Even now, the axe of God's judgment is poised, ready to sever the root of the trees. Yes, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. But even among this crowd, Repentant hearts were found. And John calls each of them to repent, each repentant heart to express their repentance through a transformed life, as we read in Luke 3, verse 10. The crowds asked, what should we do? John replied, if you have two shirts, give one to the poor. If you have food, share it with those who are hungry. Even corrupt tax collectors came to be baptized and asked, teacher, what should we do? He replied, collect no more taxes than the government requires. What should we do? Asked some soldiers. John replied, don't exhort money or make false accusations and be content with your pay. If you are blessed, then be a blessing. If you have more than you need, then consider those that are in need. It's then really interesting that John doesn't go on to say to these corrupt tax collectors that they should change what they do for a living. Instead, John calls them to have the good news transform what they do for a living and not rip other people off. To the soldiers, these are not soldiers as we would imagine them today but rather they would fit somewhere on the spectrum between police and local muscle, local thugs, that would help get money out of people for either the tax collectors or for themselves. As we've previously acknowledged, so far in this series, Luke talks about a heightening of messianic expectation, about a heightening of the arrival of the Messiah. And with all the activity and all the recognition that there was something different about John, that God was obviously at work in and through him, that made people wonder as we continue to look into Luke's account in chapter 3, verse 15. Everyone was expecting the Messiah to come soon and they were eager to know whether John might be the Messiah. John answered their questions by saying, I baptize you with water, but someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater than I'm not even worthy to be his slave and untie the straps of his sandals. But he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He is ready to separate the chaff from the wheat with his winnowing fork, and then he will clean up the threshing floor, gather all the wheat into his barn, but burning the chaff with never-ending fire. John used many such warnings as he announced the good news to the people. But John's message wasn't always well received. Around a year later, he was prepared to speak up and speak out about Herod divorcing his wife to marry Herodias, who who had been married to his half-brother. And we read about that in verse 19 of Luke 3. John also criticized Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee, for marrying Herodias, his brother's wife, 
and for many other wrongs he had done. So Herod put John in prison, adding this to his uh, this uh, adding this sin to his many others. So what about us? What about us today? In what can seem a world away, what do we make out of these verses? At times we can see an echo into the same landscape, corruption and rorting in government, political interference or at times pressure on the church around the world and it still happens today. We can easily position ourselves and point the finger at the world out there and boo and hiss when we see corruption, oppression and the encroachment on our freedoms. We who have grown up in the church can at times know church culture better than we actually know God. And we can look to God to bring judgment on the world around us for their shortcomings, all the while forgetting that we are the ones that need saving from our sins. When we look out for our own self-interest, when we uh, are in the process of trampling on others to get ahead, when we deny justice to others while crying foul if someone in a hurry cuts in our line, when we, when we fudge the facts to save face, we too need saving from our sins. To deny our stuff-ups, to say that we don't need the Messiah, we need to have a change of heart and to see our need for Jesus' grace and mercy applied to our life. We've got a cartoon there. I'm not sure whether you can see the, the bottom caption, but it's a group of people sitting around in a lounge room and the caption is, well, I haven't actually died to sin, but I did feel kind of faint once. To have a change of heart can't stop there. John and later James calls for us to have a change of heart that leads to a transformed life. As followers of Jesus, we are called to bear witness to the world around us, the world in which we live, in both word and deed, of the transformational power of Jesus in our life. We are called to look out for others doing it tough. At Northern, we have a long history of doing that through Northern Community Care Works. And as I mentioned during our, our family news time, our announcement time, uh, we, we've been able to raise $500 for those that are affected by bushfires. And that just shows the temperature of our hearts, which is great. But we also need to continue to be prepared to speak truth to power, regardless of the political party or who holds the purse strings. In a world where activism can hide between, uh, behind a hashtag and we can get on board with something out of the whim or like John the Baptist criticising those that were coming in the crowds just to get on board to look good. We can jump on board and hashtag or like something on Facebook because it, it makes us feel good, but at times it can make little difference. We need to be prepared to speak truth to power. We need to be prepared to, to challenge even when it comes at a cost. We need to be ready to act on truth even when it is not comfortable. And while there will be times where we need to shake our fists at what is going wrong, there will also be other times where we need to put our arm around a friend and ask them, hey, what's going on? What's going on for you at the moment? John was prepared to call for change and it cost him. So how might we respond today? Well, there's a couple of questions that I've got on the screen that you can read and I wonder are you ready for change are you ready to deal with things in your own life are you ready to um, be prepared to step into moments and times where uh, you need to represent the truth and to shed light into dark situations well the questions are is there an area in my life that I need God's saving power at work at the moment Perhaps you might want to write a prayer of response to that. Perhaps you might want to invite God to help you to bear witness in a world, in word and deed to the world around us. In, in this area, whatever this area of your life might be, it might be at work, it might be with neighbours, it might be with family or friends. 
that you would bear witness in word and deed to help people see Jesus. Or perhaps you might want to ask the Holy Spirit to help you to speak the truth in dark times, even when it comes at a cost. We're going to have some music played, and as the music's played, I invite you to pull out those response cards and take some time to to write a prayer of response that God is laying on your heart. It might be from the message, it might be from something else that you've heard today, from Lynn's communion, from the Bible reading, whatever it might be. But yet, let's use this time to respond to the things that God is saying to us today. God bless you.